Hey everyone, uh, we're going to try something new today. Uh, this is an idea that I've been tossing around for a while for a series of videos about rapamycin, and I think we're going to call this the R files. And the idea here is to just talk about all sorts of topics related to rapamycin. Probably many of you are familiar with rapamycin as the gold standard of pharmacological or drug interventions to increase lifespan, improve health span metrics, at least in laboratory animals. And I've shared publicly sort of my own experiences taking rapamycin, and I've spent quite a bit of my career studying rapamycin and its role in um, targeting the mechanisms of aging. And so I thought what we do today for this first episode is take you way back to when I first got interested in studying rapamycin and, and how that came about. And it's sort of fitting. Um, you can see I've got this uh, wrap on my arm. No, this is not an injury. I actually just had a blood draw to measure rapamycin levels in my blood. I am now in week four of my current cycle of using rapamycin off-label, and we'll talk about that in a future episode, I'm sure. So to start with today, um, I want to take you back to 2003. So this was just after I had completed my PhD thesis with Lenny Garenti at MIT. Then I spent about a year and a half in a biotech startup company called Longenity. Um, that company was actually aimed at sort of developing human biological aging clocks. So we were a couple of decades before our time. Um, and then that didn't work out. So I uh, returned to Seattle along with my wife in 2003 to start our postdoctoral uh, work. And I decided to join Stanley Fields Lab at the University of Washington in the Department of Genome Sciences, where I started working alongside a graduate student named Trey Powers to form an aging group in Stan's lab. And it was really that uh, decision to come back to Seattle to go to Stan's lab that led me um, on my path to get um, interested and start studying rapamycin. And this was in large part because when I came to the University of Washington, uh, another uh, scientist there named Brian Kennedy was an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry at that time. And like myself, Brian was a former graduate student of Lenny Garenti. We didn't overlap in the lab. Brian finished his PhD, I think about a year, year and a half before I joined Lenny's lab. But we'd met a couple of times uh, while we were in Boston, and so we, we knew each other. And when I came to the University of Washington, one of the first things that I did uh, was to get together with Brian. And I sort of vividly remember this conversation we had over coffee in a, a place in the medical center called the Rotunda, where we started talking about, um, you know, the aging field, uh, some of the uh, areas that were unexplored. And it was really that discussion that led to a collaboration between myself and, and Brian um, that has spanned two decades, still going strong. And we've published, I think, probably 70, maybe more co-authored papers together. So it's been a highly fruitful and productive collaboration. And like the best of scientific collaborations has been a ton of fun and led to a really, really powerful friendship. So that was the starting point uh, of my rapamycin um, sort of journey. And when Brian and I sat down, we were talking about sort of aging in general, the field, sort of where it was at at this time. Again, this was 2003, so 20 years ago. And in particular, uh, a very specialized portion of the field that had to do with studying aging in the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And for our PhD work in Lenny's lab, both Brian and I had studied a specific form of aging in yeast called replicative lifespan, or RLS. And I really don't want to get too far into the weeds on yeast aging, but I think it's useful just to say that RLS was a, is, is a model of aging in a single-celled organism um, where what you do is you determine how many times can an individual mother cell divide? How many daughter cells can that cell produce before it undergoes senescence, replicative senescence? And it depends a little bit on the genetic background, but in most yeast strains, that's about 20 times. And that's referred to as the replicative lifespan of the mother cell. So for you longevity aficionados, one thing that's interesting to note is that in this case, yeast replicative lifespan 
it's not a measure of chronological lifespan. And chronological lifespan is really what we usually measure in pretty much every other organism that we study and also in people, right? The length of time that uh, an individual live. This is not a measure of time. It's a measure of biological age. And again, there's an episode on biological aging that I refer you to within the OptiSpan YouTube channel that, that gets a little deeper into this, but it's just useful to appreciate. This is one of maybe the only commonly used model system for studying aging where the metric itself is really a metric of biological age. Now, sometimes you'll hear people refer to replicative aging in yeast as a measure of reproduction. That's completely wrong. Maybe I'll get alone, get into that in a standalone episode at some point down the road. But for now, um, I would just say stop listening to those folks. They don't understand evolutionary biology and how natural selection acts to influence reproduction and longevity, replicative aging in yeast is absolutely not a measure of reproduction. The true measure of reproduction in active dividing yeast is rate of division, so doubling time. Replicative aging really is a good measure, I believe, of biological aging in this system. And one of the reasons why I think it's a good measure of biological aging is we've now learned that the genetic and environmental determinants of replicative aging are in fact highly evolutionarily conserved across many, many different species all the way up to mammals. So going from yeast to nematode worms to fruit flies to mice, there's a high degree of conservation of the genes that seem to affect longevity going from replicative aging in yeast all the way up the evolutionary ladder. And that's what we want from a model system that we use to study aging. So, okay, Brian and I had both studied replicative aging in the Garenti lab. And I'm gonna take a little detour to talk about that work that we both did in Lenny's lab because it set the stage for this conversation and why we decided to start down the path that we did. So when Brian was a graduate student in Lenny's lab, again, this was a few years before I joined the lab, um, he and another student named Nick Ostriaco really were the ones who first pioneered the study of aging in yeast in Lenny's lab. And one of the things that Brian and Nick discovered was that a gene called SIR4, that stands for Silent Information Regulator 4 in yeast, was a potent regulator of yeast replicative lifespan. Um, and so they published a series of papers um, uh, on this showing that you could make mutations in SIR4 and affect lifespan and increase lifespan. Now, SIR4 is a yeast specific gene, yeast specific protein, meaning you don't find SIR4 in worms or fruit flies or mice or people, but it acts in a complex with a set of other proteins, SIR1, SIR2, and SIR3, um, to regulate function at telomeres. And of course, telomeres are one of the hallmarks of aging. So there's a connection here, maybe not at the individual gene or protein level, but with a hallmark of aging, which suggested a potential mechanism by which SIR4 might be affecting aging in yeast. And that was a large part of what Brian studied in Lenny's lab. Now, when I joined the lab, this was again, a while after Brian had left, I started talking with David Sinclair, who was a postdoc in the lab at that time. And one of the interesting things that came out of our conversations was that we both thought that maybe SIR2, remember SIR2 was one of the proteins that was in this complex with SIR4 at the telomeres, maybe SIR2 was actually the place where we should be looking for um, interesting effects on, on longevity. And one of the reasons for that was that unlike SIR4, SIR2 did have homologs up the evolutionary ladder all the way up to humans. Now the word sir I I don't think was even in existence at this point. This would have been about, you know, early 1998, but, um, but you've heard the word sirtuins, and that just refers to this entire family of sir2 homologs all the way up to humans. So sir2 ends is where that word comes from. So we thought that sir2 might be interesting to study for that reason. We also noted that unlike sir4, sir2 also functioned at the ribosomal DNA or rDNA. And based on previous work of David's, we had reason to believe that the rDNA might also, like the telomeres, be an important location in the genome for affecting aging, at least particularly in yeast. So I decided to start studying SIR2 as part of my thesis work. And I promise we'll, we'll get to rapamycin, but this is all setting the stage for, for why Brian and I did what we did a few years later. So what I knew at this point early in my, my time in Lenny's lab was that if we deleted SIR2, we could make a knockout yeast where there's no SIR2, that shortened lifespan by about 50%. 
And so an obvious next question was, what happened if we put more SIR2 into the cells? This is actually, I think, an important distinction. So um, just because something shortens lifespan when you knock it out, that doesn't really mean that that gene or protein is affecting aging. There are lots of ways to shorten lifespan that have absolutely nothing to do with the biological aging process, right? I could choose to walk across the freeway back and forth until I got hit by a car. That didn't accelerate my biological aging, but it could very definitely shorten my lifespan. So shortening lifespan is a very nonspecific uh, metric if we're really interested in aging. What you really want to do is show that you can make things better, which is much harder to do in a biological system. It's way easier to break a biological system than it is to make it better. So Mitch McVeigh and I, Mitch was a graduate student um, in the lab at the same time I was there, we decided to collaborate to do sort of the critical next experiment, which was to ask the question, what happens if we put more SIR2 into a yeast cell? Could we increase lifespan? Because if you increase lifespan, at least by a large extent, almost by definition, you have to have ha affected the biological aging process um, directly. And what we found was a sort of remarkably large impact from just putting in a second copy of SIR2. We could increase lifespan over wild type cells, cells that had one copy, by about 30%. And so this was a really nice, I think, demonstration that dosage of SIR2 is a potent regulator of longevity, at least in budding yeast. And this result, I think, really set the stage for the rise of sirtuins in the aging field. After we showed this effect in yeast, then Heidi Tissenbaum, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, showed that you could accomplish the same thing in C. elegans, nematode worms, by overexpressing the SIR2 ortholog called SIR2.1. Then other people did the same thing in flies. And, and then the field really started paying attention. And you know this really led to, I think, the rise of the sir as a dominant sort of area of research in the field, certainly at least for the next decade. And one of the consequences of this, and this is no exaggeration, when I joined Lenny's lab, nobody was studying sirtuins. And by the time I left the lab, a little bit over four years later, everybody in the lab was studying sirtuins in one way, shape, or form. And to me, that actually was a little bit, um, I, I don't know if disappointing is the right word, but uh, but it, 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 I think, frustrated me a little bit that, that the lab had become so narrow by the time I left. And I really wanted to go out and do something different. So fast forward a couple of years, I had my little foray uh, working on biological aging clocks 20 years too soon um, to this meeting over coffee with Brian. And by then the Sirtuin fire was going strong in the field. And I think Brian and I both felt like the field in many ways had become too preoccupied, not just with Sirtuins, but with Sirtuins and a relatively small number of other genes and pathways that most people were very, very interested in studying. And we were both convinced that there were a bunch of other genes like Sir2 out there, but nobody knew about them and nobody was looking for them, at least in yeast. Um, and so, you know, we tossed around that, that idea and I think settled on setting out to do something ambitious, maybe a little bit crazy, which was an unbiased screen for new longevity genes in yeast using the yeast replicative aging model. And so I'd say lesson number one here is, you know, in science, like in many other areas of life, when everyone is going in one direction, sometimes there's a lot of value in looking the other direction and maybe going the other direction. And so that's really what came out of this initial conversation with Brian was this ambitious goal to try to kind of look outside the lamppost, look outside the box and see what other people were missing simply because they weren't looking. So I mentioned this idea of an unbiased genetic screen. So I want to break that down for a second. So the unbiased part really means, you know, not pretending that you're smarter than the biology, letting the biology tell you what's important. In other words, we're not going to go in thinking we already know what the important genes are, or what the important mechanisms are. It, and, and, in, and in many ways, this is a sort of a pure geneticist approach. As a geneticist, I feel much more confident in the validity of the results if it wasn't biased by sort of pre-existing assumptions. So you take a step back and you ask, is there a way that we can look without biasing ourselves in as broad a way as possible uh, at a particular biological process? And so... We were interested in aging, and so we thought lifespan is the place to look. Again, I mentioned earlier that if you can increase lifespan, almost by definition, you have to affect the biological aging process. So we thought increased lifespan is the place to look. 
And we wanted to know, could we come up with a way to do this for hundreds or thousands of genes and, and just do it randomly going across the genome? Now, we were very fortunate that by this time, other laboratories had created a set of strains called the yeast knockout deletion collection, uh, about 5,000 strains, each of which were lacking a single non-essential gene. And so we could those strains already existed, and so all we had to do was figure out how do we measure replicative lifespan for all of them. And then in principle, we could just step by step go across the entire genome and ask which genes are important for longevity, specifically looking for gene deletions that increase lifespan. Um, now, the only thing we couldn't look at there were essential genes, because by definition, if you delete an essential gene, lifespan is zero. Essential genes are really interesting. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But at least for now, we could, we could in principle, look at the non-essential genes. So we decided to do this. And um, I think most people thought we were crazy, but we were confident that we would find a lot of cool stuff just by looking for it. Now, why would people think we're crazy? I, and I think the reason why uh, this was such a challenging undertaking was at this time, there really was no automated or high throughput way to measure replicative lifespan in yeast. This assay involves sitting at a microscope and manually micromanipulating daughter cells away from mother cells. Again, I mentioned it's usually about 20 daughter cells per mother cell before that mother cell senesces. And that takes a lot of time. Uh, I think it's probably not uh, an exaggeration to say that between my PhD and my postdoc, I literally spent thousands of hours at a microscope measuring yeast replicative lifespan. Now, not everyone can say that they were the best at something in the world, uh, but for a period of a few years there, I think it's safe to say that um, I was the undisputed world champion at yeast replicative lifespan. So I don't know if that, well, I don't know what that makes me, um, but, uh, but at least I can put that on my resume. So, um, so anyways, in this first meeting over coffee, Brian and I came up with a plan to measure replicative lifespan for each of these 5,000 strains, uh, all of them lacking one gene. And we figured it'd probably take about 10 years to do, and we were right. It took about 10 years to do it. Um, but eventually we were able to build up a team of about 10 people and march our way across the genome one by one. Uh, and we found a whole bunch of genes, new genes that affected lifespan in yeast, many of which also affect lifespan in other organisms. Um, but at first it was just Brian and me uh, for really probably the first year and a half to two years, it was Brian and I sitting at microscopes in his laboratory at the University of Washington, dissecting yeast mother cells. Now it was mostly me that did all the work, but uh, actually I have to give Brian a lot of credit. Um, so Brian was an assistant professor at this point with all the pressures that go along with trying to get tenure. And I, he probably spent four hours a day at the microscope with me dissecting yeast cells. And not many assistant professors would do that. And that time at the microscope, I think, really cemented a lot of the foundation for our ongoing um, friendship. So, um, so that, those were good times that I look back at fondly, although I must admit, I'm glad I'm not spending eight hours a day looking through a microscope counting yeast daughter cells anymore. So I think one of the lessons here is don't be afraid of hard work as long as it's smart work. I think the reason nobody else was doing this was because it was actually really hard in the sense that it takes a lot of time and effort to do this yeast replicative lifespan um, assay. So we started randomly going through the deletion collection and we came up with a scheme where, you know, we wouldn't measure 50 mother cells for every strain. We started with five cells for each strain. And then we would, based on the, the median lifespan of those five cells in the distribution, come up with some probabilistic way of, of determining if we should look at more cells. So the things that looked interesting, there was a hint maybe that they were long lived. We would look at more cells until we got up to about 20 cells for a particular genotype. And then if that still looked promising, then we would go further and validate through a variety of methods that, that I won't get into. So it was this sort of iterative process where we could actually start to march through the genome, at least at, at a relatively um, reasonable pace. And when we started down this path, you know, we initially had the idea that we would start with, with five plates from the deletion collection. And these were in 96 well plates, each well had a different strain, so one gene deletion. And then we would sort of evaluate where we were at. So this is a little less than, than 500 strains. 
And I think the honest truth is we got really lucky because the Tor deletion mutant or Tor 1 in yeast deletion mutant just happened to be in the first five sets of plates that we looked at and it was long lived. Um, so sometimes, you know, again, in science, being lucky plays a role. And, and we were honestly very lucky that Tor happened to be in that first set of 500 strains. So I want to take a second and just talk about Tor in yeast. You may be wondering, is Tor 1 in yeast? So it was the Tor 1 deletion mutant that was long lived. You may be wondering, is that the same as mTOR in other organisms or in mice, if you've heard about mTOR? mTOR stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. And yes, Tor 1 in yeast is the same protein as mTOR in mice. But I think it's useful to just to a brief tangent on um, yeast Tor biology. So if you don't care, it's okay, you can zone out for about 30 seconds and just go by what I just said. But if you're interested, you, many of you are undoubtedly familiar with the idea there are two mTOR complexes. And this is true in every eukaryote from yeast all the way up to people that we know of. mTOR complex one or mTOR one and mTOR complex two or mTOR two. And you may also be aware that rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of mTOR complex one. So rapamycin has no direct effect on mTOR complex two. And as far as we can tell, it's really mTOR complex one that seems to be important for aging, or at least predominantly important for aging. Again, all the way from yeast up, up through mice. Now, the thing where yeast are a little bit different is most other eukaryotes have only a single mTOR gene. So there's one mTOR gene, which codes for one mTOR protein, and that mTOR protein can act in both mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Now in yeast, there are two TOR genes, TOR1 and TOR2. And this gets confusing because those, those are different from mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two. So the yeast TOR1 gene codes for the TOR1 protein, which can only act in mTOR complex 1, okay? That's the rapamycin-sensitive complex. The yeast TOR2 gene codes for the TOR2 protein, which looks a lot like TOR1, but not identical, and it can function in both mTOR complexes, mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. Okay, the reason why I'm going into this much detail is that the TOR2 gene in yeast is essential, meaning we couldn't look at it in our screen because it's a dead yeast. But the TOR1 gene, because it only functions in mTOR complex 1, and, and TOR2 can also function in mTOR complex 1, is viable. And I think the way I would think about it is the TOR1 gene deletion is like a low dose of rapamycin. So you get partial inhibition of mTOR complex 1, like you would with low-dose rapamycin, but not enough inhibition of mTOR complex 1 to cause lethality. So just think of the TOR1 TOR deletion, which is what we found to be long-lived in yeast, to be sort of equivalent to low-dose rapamycin in terms of its effect on mTOR complex 1 activity. Okay, that's the aside. Now back to the, the main theme here. So as I mentioned, we got lucky that the TOR1 deletion mutant was in the first almost 500 that we screened. Interestingly, we found 12 other gene deletions that were long-lived among that first set of genes as well, only one of which, FOB1, which I also studied as, as a graduate student just by chance, had, was previously known. So this is the beauty of an unbiased genetic screen. We didn't go in with preconceived notions. Almost everything we found was brand new and novel. And TOR obviously was important, but there were other things in there that turned out to be interesting as well, like ribosomal proteins and ribosomal accessory factors, which also turn out to affect the aging process in higher eukaryotes, in nematodes and fruit flies and in mice. So this is, again, I think evidence for this highly conserved uh, feature of aging across very, very diverse organisms. Okay, so this story is about Tor and rapamycin. And again, I wish I could say that I'd been smart and I like knew going in that Tor was gonna be really important and rapamycin was gonna be this really cool longevity drug. But the reality is I didn't. We, we went in just with our eyes, eyes open, wide open, not knowing what we were gonna find and we found Tor. But as soon as Tor came out as a potent effector of replicative lifespan or Tor1 in our data set, of course, one of the first things that I did was go to the literature and try to see what do we know about Tor. And again, I wish I could say that I knew everything about Tor back in 2003 or 2004 when this was happening in real time. 
but I didn't. But I learned really quickly all about mTOR complex one and mTOR complex two and its relationship to nutrient sensing and this drug, rapamycin, which seemed really interesting. Now, the thing that caught my attention right away was this relationship to nutrient sensing because Brian and I, in a sort of parallel study, had been looking at the mechanisms by which caloric restriction could extend lifespan in yeast and in other organisms. And at that point, we disproven the hypothesis that caloric restriction was working through SIR2, but we really had no clue what caloric restriction was working through. And so this immediately suggested a hypothesis that turning down TOR signaling was a mechanism by which caloric restriction might extend lifespan. So for our first paper, which was published in Science um, in 2005, uh, that's what we focused on. We focused on these 13 genes, specifically TOR1, and then we went and did some experiments to test whether or not TOR1 was in the same pathway as caloric restriction, and it turned out that it was. So that allowed us to propose this new hypothesis at the time that caloric restriction was working to extend replicative lifespan in yeast and potentially in other organisms by turning down mTOR complex 1 signaling. And so that was the take home from that paper. Now, you might be asking, why didn't we look at rapamycin? And we did, but it turned out, just sort of due to technical details, funny to the yeast replicative aging assay, we couldn't actually test whether rapamycin extended lifespan, replicative lifespan in yeast. And this is because rapamycin is unstable in the media that we use for measuring yeast replicative lifespan over a time period of about 48 hours. Meaning if you put the rapamycin in the media, you can see within, certainly within 48 hours, even within 24 hours, that it's lost much of its biological activity. And these replicative lifespan experiments really take about three weeks to complete. So we just couldn't do that experiment. And so that's why we didn't look at rapamycin directly in that paper. But of course we were interested. And so this is where Trey Powers, who I mentioned earlier and I started working on a kind of a workaround where we could study in a little bit more detail whether or not rapamycin affected lifespan in yeast. And the approach that we took was to turn to something called the chronological lifespan assay in yeast. And again, I don't want to get into the, the, de the, the weeds on chronological aging versus replicative aging, but as you probably can appreciate from the name, chronological aging is a more a uh, direct measure of length of lifespan in time, more like the way we think about longevity in other organisms, as opposed to replicative aging, which is more of a direct measure of biological aging. The other key difference here is that replicative aging is, as I mentioned, a metric of how many daughter cells or how many cell cycles can an individual mother cell complete before senescence. Chronological aging is a measure of how long can a yeast cell survive in a non-dividing state before it becomes metabolically inactive and dies? So again, it's a length of time versus number of divisions. And we could actually assess directly the effect of rapamycin in this chronological aging assay because it wasn't susceptible to the same technical limitations in terms of stability of the drug that the replicative aging assay was. So we tested rapamycin in this assay and found that it dramatically increased lifespan as did the TOR1 deletion mutant. And so that was really nice because it provided both a genetic test in the TOR1 deletion mutant and a pharmacological test with a drug in the form of rapamycin. And both of them showed this, this very dramatic increase in chronological lifespan. So this paper with Trey was published in 2006 in Genes and Development. Um, the title was Extension of Chronological Lifespan in Yeast by Decreased TOR Pathway Signaling. And this study was the first study ever showing that rapamycin could increase lifespan. Now, I know a lot of people think the 2009 paper uh, from the interventions testing program was the first study to show lifespan extension from rapamycin, but that's not correct. This one was. And again, I think this points out the utility of simple model organisms like yeast and nematode worms and fruit flies for longevity drug discovery, um, because you can do these kinds of experiments much more rapidly. And in many cases, the outcomes in simple organisms are highly predictive of whether or not those interventions are going to work in a complex mammal like a mouse.
And so that's the story about how I got interested in studying rapamycin. Uh, it really came directly from uh, a sort of fortuitous uh, landing spot at the University of Washington when Brian Kennedy was there, that conversation that we had recognizing that um, there was an opportunity where other people weren't looking. And then I would say, you know, the guts and fortitude to do something really hard. And, you know, there was no guarantee that we were going to find something as interesting as Tor. But I think Brian and I both were confident that there was a lot of unexplored territory out there and we would find something interesting by starting on this very uh, intensive, unbiased screen for new longevity genes. And I'll just finish by saying, I kind of feel like the field is in many ways at a similar point today. The field has become very narrow, in my view, at studying the hallmarks of aging, and very few people are looking outside of the hallmarks of aging. And I think there are opportunities, much like there were back in 2003, for courageous people who want to go look at the dark matter where nobody else is looking to find completely new ways to impact longevity, probably of much larger effect size than what we know about today. And so that's something I'm very interested in. And you'll have to stay tuned and see where we go. But I think there's good reason to believe that there are lots of opportunities out there um, and it's ready just for somebody to go out and grab it. So um, with that, that's my uh, introduction to rapamycin. And uh, we'll come back in the next episode with a discussion of how I got to the point where I first decided to take rapamycin myself off-label. So part two will be coming out soon. Please subscribe below and make sure you don't miss it.